Feet feel the ground of an immigrant-infested town. Brown, white, black, yellow. Stepped on by the multicolored feet above me, the patterns of their footsteps made music on the ground as they walk, fighting every day for the existence of their kind in a new world filled with new dreams and hopes. Love guided them to a place where they felt comfortable. Love guided them to a place where they felt like they could hang their coats up after that long and tiring day. Love guided them to a place where they sought out freedom in a new land to make sure that their children and grandchildren were able to play on playgrounds and write English on school desks, where the only running they ever had to do was in gym class. Saying those three words was as rare as an AB negative blood type, yet they seemed to express them better than I ever could. Cracked lips pucker to form a kiss. Clemmy hands slide to create one bodily formation. Embarrassed to admit that my hands were the clammy ones, I blamed it on yours. Sweet smiles from the bubble tea that we drank together in that cheap Asian grocery store. I uttered those three words to make sure that the fact that you were mine was set within my mind, yet how could I love you if I barely know what it means? It came out of these rosebud lips far too quickly. I looked down at the floor in embarrassment and desire to become invisible, vanishing through the ground, wondering how they found out what love meant, wondering how they were able to express it without having to say it over and over, I love you, I love you, nothing. I love you, I love you, nothing is there. Feet feel the ground of an immigrant infested town. Steps to the subway, to the place where I could hang my coat up after this long and tiring day. Doors open to a smell of freshly baked something, sweet smiles from a woman that I know best. Brown, white, black, yellow. Colors of the meal she prepares with tired hands every night at around six. I love you. Inspired by the beats in hip hop or the beat in jazz, beat poets in the 1940s created their own unique rhythm through their own unique voice. Hi, I'm Sammy. Unfortunately, I don't have this memorized, so I'm gonna use this. <laughs> After realizing my love for old school rap and underground hip hop, I attempted to write raps for a couple of months, but had no beat to actually put my words to. And obviously, I'm probably not a great rapper, I'm white and Jewish. And I ended up spending hours on YouTube listening to Atmosphere or a Tribe Called Quest and even NWA. And after bobbing my head in that circular motion for a couple of hours, I had a moment of realization. All of these songs and artists spoke with conviction and authenticity. And all of their stories spoke to me and actually stuck with me and got me thinking about life and society in general. And then I started taking more time and procrastinating with my homework, and I actually fell into the side of YouTube where spoken word poetry, poetry cultivated passion and beauty within its gardens. And then I started really falling in love with poetry, and especially spoken word poetry. And after writing many poems and realizing my love for this art form, I decided to take it to my school. Now, I go to a school where the arts are declining like many other high schools and people are becoming easily manipulated into believing that it's unimportant to a person's everyday experience in school. Now, little do they know that I, along with many others, need some type of creativity in my life. Never being the person who got the A in science or the A in math, I really, really thrived in English or social studies, mainly English. And it never really gave me what I really wanted. So I desired and, desired and craved something special. And this is when I brought spoken word poetry to my high school. And for me, this was a perfect challenge to bring slam poetry to a high school filled with ignorance. And my goal was to actually find the few people left who appreciated poetry and art as much as I did. And I created a club, Slam Poetry, where people could come every Thursday to feel safe, comfortable, and let go of all the stress that high school brings. And on the first day, the turnout was not as disappointing as expected. People actually came and wanted to enjoy poetry, which really surprised me. And the group started off with 10 people, yet around eight were truly committed. And it ultimately became known as the Slamily, because slam poetry. And they had a certain desire to see poetry in a new light and had faith in me to expose them to new ideas and risk taking. 
They wrote every Thursday until they were inspired to create full-length poems regarding topics such as depression, divorce, love, religion, and even drugs. And one day, I took a leap of faith and asked each and every one of them if they would be willing to actually do a flash mob in the school cafeteria. And not the kind of flash mob that involves like dancing and high school musical and like singing, and, but a flash mob that actually is poetry based, getting up on tables and telling your stories. And surprisingly, they were all really, really excited about it and really accepting and kind of trusted me. And on a Thursday, we decided to get up on the tables and just surprise everyone in the cafeteria. Now you can obviously imagine their reactions. They were like, what is this? Like, they're obviously like getting the table really dirty right now and like, I really don't want to do this. So we went up there and we just did it. And it was literally the craziest moment of my life. And I think that it was really, really changing to the environment that we've been stuck in at my school. And so we defied all social norms and people were really excited and accepting and it ranged from utter excitement and joy to obviously like what is she doing and so unfortunately I don't have an actual video of the flash mob but I do have three people with me here today from the group and I want to show you their final products and what we've been trying to work on all year and it's become a truly amazing experience for me Smriti, Sophie and Joe and they're gonna all come out now Just give a hug. It's the least you can do to lift from the hole that's been dug in the cold, cold earth. Self-esteem quicksand questioning if there's any worth in pointless existence. The gap between mind and body, life and reason is too great a distance, purposeless atoms so small. Humans' trophies of war inevitably mounted on life's wall. Inner workings unknown. Gears that plague the soul like cuts down to the bone, bone that one can't see. Skeletal structures splendid enough to have been designed by divinity. But there's none to be found, just words of reassurance and fairy tales about the time we're not around. Stuck in the spider web of that undivine creation, life is the chew toy of our mental mastication. Blackout shades facilitate self-hibernation, prevent the brain from leaving that rotten synaptic station. So on and on we plod, living listless lives, dreaming the face of a faceless god. Psychosomatic allergies to the twine let down and the hands that connect it to those fool's crowns. Feet that connect it to slain mockingbird town decide to slip away and in the pit drown. Animals look down below in disgust upon the one buried deep in earth's crust. Scale of judgment descends us unjust. Want to do what we can but can't do what we must. So let down some rope or any object that can help us grasp life with hope. Climb up from the ravine. Embrace elevating the afflicted human being. Sometimes a hug is all you need. Try to snap. Make it an experience. This is to and on behalf of anyone who's ever had family problems. I've seen my parents hold knives in their fists, facing each other in that defensive warrior stance. I've seen my sister and I use our physical bodies to barricade the front door, preventing my father from leaving. I've seen a broken limb of a chair abandoned on the ground and shards of glass thrown on the originally clean kitchen tiles. I've seen my mother and I I see my mother tell my sister and I to pack our bags and get in the car because we're not coming back. Too many times have I woken up to the... Too many times have I woken up to... Sound. Okay. Too many times have I woken up to the sound of these interminable fights. Too many times have I caressed their eardrums with my... Too many times have I let my own voice caress their eardrums telling them to stop. I've seen so many tears and listened to so many screams at the point of every time I hear the word parents, I think pain. Well, you know, I've also seen laughter and care in this one shipwreck family. 
my parents, they have brought up the topic of divorce on several occasions. Maybe in the past I would have broken down on the spot if I even heard them mutter the word. But I've come to realize that no matter how much hatred is shown, there's still that tinge of love that keeps their marriage and this family together. There's still that lifeless voice in the back of my head telling me, have hope. Even if that hope is hanging by a thread so thin that it may snap with the passing of a breeze, have hope. The ship carries many holes and wounds where salt water leaks through and into the ship with every second that passes. But as much as the ship is in complete ruins, and as much as the ship is a completely hopeless seeming mess, someone always comes along to clear the water and alleviate this pain. No matter how old and terrible the ship is, it will never sink. Four women sit cross-legged on the floor, their eyes far away, their heads tilted back on white walls, black hair tied up, streaks of gray, streaks of light. Warmth hits them intermittently, hazing, lazy. The streets never seem to entice them, they never seem to beckon them. As it is, the four women were doing their jobs. Dawn, they were up and running and feeding and caring <laughs> They were up and running and feeding everyone with care and worry and hurried affection, cleaning, 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 children, husbands, dishes, homes, past lives, future lives, praise be damned. As it is, four women would turn to their saviors, gods, deities, spouses, talking, speaking, thinking, convinced that when their bones finally gave way, when they both left this place, this earth, they were doomed to be part of an eternal cycle. As it is, as fate would have it, Four women finally left. They left this place, this very earth, and landed somewhere with noise, powerful, overwhelming noise of efficiency. Was it heaven? Efficiency, that metallic affection that demands blood. Dawn, the black hair, the black hair fell down, straggling mess, combination of want, obligation of need. The roads pulled them in, forced them out, dyed the gray streaks, dulled the warmth, gave them something they never knew they wanted. Whirling, spinning, transforming, and yet, Television murmuring, coffee cups in hand, they were still four women sitting cross-legged in the dead of the night on the floor with their heads tilted back on brick walls, staring at each other with lifelessness. So this is really about them. And I think that they were a little nervous because this is like a TED talk and it's really legit. And so, They've only really done this in front of me or their other club members. There's about eight of them. And I just want to show you how actually young they are. So let's go around and say a little bit something about ourselves. Hi, I'm Joseph Benamar. I'm 15 years old. And I am but a shadow of the word. Hi, I'm Smriti Karwa. I'm 16 years old. And I am but the shadow of a word. Hello, my name is Sophia Zhang. And I'm 16. And I am but a shadow of the world. Thank you.